on, you know. Have you have you recently been let down by your charismatic religion? Well, <laughs> we have a place for you. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and tonight I want to ask Father and Cyprian, um, what is the food at, because we're, this is probably one of the last times I can ask a food question because we're entering nativity, <laughs> but what is the food at Thanksgiving you are just looking forward to the most? Like, uh, what's the, th- oh yeah, it's like, what's the thing you look forward to every year? I'm gonna let that question just hang out. I mean, so not not so much anymore because it's tied to a person. Uh, so it will never now that she's no longer in the world. But my my grandmother's my my dad's mom's macaroni and cheese. Mm. That was always it, man. Like what she do? What she do different? It's just. I mean, she's just. It's just. She's just a southern woman you know what i mean it's like from louisiana and she just she just murked the macaroni and cheese like, yeah. i don't know what was in it but it was incredible you know it's <laughs> i mean it's the classic southern macaroni and cheese like a casserole you know with the yeah. the real it's almost like crispy the cheese on the top and then inside it's just like molten lava of cheese and oh yeah just even thinking about it i don't know i don't and and multiple different kinds of cheeses in there i know yeah. like oh i oh incredible if you were in the incredible. midwest there'd be a can of cream of mushroom soup in there as well probably like oh, mixed up in the noodles yeah interesting it's what never i do had it like that never I, had it like that it doesn't have to be mushrooms because my wife doesn't like mushrooms very much but a cream of something just mix it in with the noodles um oh, and then that flour. like that's like you get you then you set those noodles aside and then you start working on your cheeses so yeah, it's baller yeah love it what about you father uh well my my wife makes this incredible cream corn oh i love cream corn. like this cheesy cream corn which is just if i just had that i'd be okay it was really good um mm. but then also too yeah you know i'm a big man she, she makes this really good green bean casserole which is really good a good green bean casserole is pretty yeah. baller too yeah does she to, put does she have the crispy onions on has, the top? I was oh, literally about to it. say it's it has an abundance of the French crispy onions. So. That's what that's the, that's the key. That's the key is in the my key. opinion to the green bean casserole is those it onions is on top. Yeah. Uh-huh. You need that. What yeah. about you, Andrew? Um, you know, I I would have said up until recently like um you know, I don't know, like I think I probably would have said like this This one year, um, a friend and I, who's like a professional cook, which is a lot more impressive than it's not as impressive as it sounds. He just cooks for a living. But he and I like did it. We don't even think it's a Thanksgiving. I think it was just like a we just went really hard on a dinner. And like for like the um, green bean casserole and stuff, he like chopped up mushrooms and then chopped up Mm -hmm. onions and like fried the uh, the mm. onions and then like mixed up the mushrooms in with like some cream of soup and then put everything like we just went we just like went really hard it was like one of the greatest meals I've ever had and that changed my mind about a lot of stuff and I think before that meal I probably would have said stuff like oh you know probably like the mac and cheese and the mashed potatoes and stuff mm-hmm. like that because that stuff is so good but the thing that we went really, really hard on was actually like, I don't think it was turkey, but it was the poultry. And last year, mm. like I found the turkey brand to buy. I found wow. the recipes. Actually, uh, Father Trevor's wife sent me a recipe. And then um, Papadia like does this whole, like, is it slow and low or is it, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm a slow and low guy. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. actually, like, if I'm, that's my very long winded way of saying, 
think actually last year was the turkey, which it's never ever been before. Mm. It's like that's my one time I sit and I carve a turkey. And like as much as I wish I had killed the turkey myself and had processed it and like did the brine myself, that pre brined turkey coupled with key. that recipe, it yeah. just the the brine just is the key to everything. Quick for the record, I just want to say this too. Just it's whatever, but man, my wife makes a mean turkey, hmm. and I, you know, I mean, for me, eternal rest in peace, you know. But like, I'll say it right here, she's surpassed both my mom and my grandma. Woo! Hmm. Yeah, and Ooh, she, yeah, wow, it's crazy. She couldn't cook when we met. Yeah, she was a she was a vegetarian when we met. She couldn't. Oh cook. wow. And um, yeah, like, yeah, she's. Andrew said, "I mean, she she's got this brine thing that she does, and those, I mean, it's crazy. Like last couple of years, her turkeys have been just, I don't know. You could pay money for them. I mean, mm. that's my biggest compliment I ever give my wife. Her cooking is, I would pay money for this." Like if I went to a restaurant and this cost this meal right here cost ten dollars, I would be like, "Okay, hey, this restaurant and this meal is going to be a thing I'm going to come back and do again and again and again and again." This is really really good, and you know I think that's interesting because like my wife also couldn't really cook. It took her a couple of years, and now she is like really getting it down. Like and like she does better during winter too. She does better with like winter and fall foods than she does with summer and spring, but <laughs> I just. It's been a real treat, I can tell you, to sit back and just, like, experience my wife's culinary journey with her, as I have had both really nasty and actually incredibly good, very, like, lovingly made food. And it's like, man, that's awesome. So, and I'm going to say this before we get started. I have been struggling with these questions, like, the last three weeks, the last three times we recorded. If anybody out there wants to send me a question that you want me to ask, just please send it to me. I'll I'll vet them. Can, can I can I tell you something though, Andrew? Sorry to interrupt you there, but um, I I think the struggle might be good because honestly, like your question and this dog is obviously wanting wanting me to shut up. But the um, last week, the question that you had basically launched the entire uh oh about the same topic of the of the episode and for a lot of people have told me that that was actually their that that they needed that episode and it was one of their favorites that's so i think maybe you should struggle okay maybe the struggle is maybe the struggle is where it's at (laughs) somewhere deep if you look in the canon or the the hymnography of the church you'll find that that talks about the need to struggle so really, if you're really is that there, is that a part of the? <laughs> if in there. Is that a part of this thing? I... <laughs> yeah, I think. I, surprise! I, I think <laughs> some obscure me. saint, some obscure Western saint, talked about it one time or something <laughs> like that. But <clears throat> so, gentlemen, what are we talking about tonight? Because I well, I, I think, think maybe it's maybe it's speaking of. That, I think that that's the perfect the perfect segue to what I wanted to because it's timely. And it's about like the opposite of struggle. And I'm, it's also this last week, there's been a bunch of things that have happened. And, um, you know, the, the promise, uh, I think culminating with this, uh, this dude getting the presidency in uh, Argentina and this What's idea of M- Malay, Mil- uh-huh. Malay, and the, what's interesting is that it had come on the heels of me having some conversations with people about, um, you know, ideologies being all oriented toward utopia and therefore all having implicit in them this idea that if everybody followed this moral framework, then no one would suffer anymore. We could all be rid of our suffering, which is like pointed away from Christ. Mm-hmm. But I, I I wanted to start, like, I, I think... This thing, when I watched the interview Tucker Carlson did with this guy, first off, he strikes me as really weird. And I'm not saying this in like a pejorative way, but I'm saying it in like the real like weird way. Like I get a, an uncanny feeling from this character. But like it's it's it was so convicting because he's basically the person that I was in 2016. Like he's a 
Uh, what? What? No, you're. I can't hear you, Father. Are you muted? You there? Oh no, nope, still can't hear you. It's okay. Well, well, well again, See, they're after him. They're after him. <laughs> they're they're after him. <laughs> Yeah, I can still can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. So I will I will continue. So this guy sideburns for days. That's all I want to say. Sideburns for days. I think the I think the fact that he's got the the flamboyant hair is also part of part the flamboyance is part of it. Hey, you got it's me like bot. Anarcho capitalist labels himself as a libertarian, quotes Hayek, you know, and I'm like, oh, this is is it is and and but the the part that is interesting to me is like the weird the weird new age atheism I would say but it's like the and and then come to find out like I found out that uh, he has actually gone on the record talking about how he's been doing like gone to like a medium or something like that and his dead dogs he talks to his dead dogs and his dead dogs tell him like give him advice on things to do. Hmm. That seems Which is like it. That seems fine. Are, I think I think we can hear you now, Father. Are you there? Okay. Oh, yep. Okay. Yeah, what it's uh, like like I was saying to you, the um I mean the thing about this is everything you said is true, but I think to make this um not more interesting, but I, I think we should also put forward, if not emphasize. The bait's too good not to take on this one either. Isn't it? I mean, I, I think, I you know, there's something to be said for, it would have been interesting if you hadn't have said everything that you just said the last five okay. minutes. <laughs> and just and just played it because... Okay, let me... Okay, let, so if people you know, ignore it, like, I'll just play it. Because <laughs> I agree with you. I, I agree with you. But I think the thing is, um, if... If you hadn't said that and just play for people, a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah. Because the bait oh. the bait's so good with this guy. You know what I mean? The bait, it's I it's see what you're saying. It's really hard not to not to swallow. It's not the same thing, but it it's in the same spectrum as um what was his name? Ryland. Um, oh yeah, the the um South, the, the Satanist South guy, the Satanist yes. guy. I mean, it's like, okay, your first run, like, oh, okay, da, da, da. but then it's like, mm. so anyways, I just want to throw that out there. It's almost if, if people who are going to see this clip, if you haven't seen it before, I'll, if you can suspend, suspend what I said, suspend what Cyprian said, and you'll finally be like, oh yeah, I'm kind of down with this guy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me, let me find, hold on, I need to just find it because I had it here. <laughs> here, let me see, share screen. Hold on, I'm gonna share the screen. I just gotta find ah here uh, here it is. Okay, share sound, optimize for video clip. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. what does it say please move this window. Oh, okay, can you see it? It's good. Yeah. Okay, let me let me move this up here. Okay, I'm gonna play this. This is just like. I don't know. This was the, this was the one. I mean, there were people could go and watch it, but this was really what where I was like, mm, that's that was a weird answer. So here, uh, let me know if you can't hear it when I play it. Do you pray for wisdom and guidance? Oh, by the way, he's speaking Spanish, so maybe I should turn it down for the people lis listening, and I'll just read. I'll just read what his response is. Bueno. Um... I know that there are many people who are praying for me. And it brings me joy to know that people go to the Kotel, to the Wailing Wall in Israel, and pray for me. I feel fine. But it's that I'm convinced that what I'm doing is right. Life without freedom is not worth living. I was once asked if I'd be willing to give my life for the ideals of freedom, and I am willing. I want to be an embodiment of that way of living, of living in freedom. 
I think slavery is a horrifying concept and I will fight for the ideals of freedom as long as I need to, whatever the consequences may be. Doing the right thing is non-negotiable. Interesting. I found mm. that interesting that he didn't answer. He didn't. Not he prays for wisdom or guidance. And that he said he wants to be an embodiment of the ideals of freedom. I don't know. Father, I'll let you... <laughs> I feel like this is more. I mean, it stands. I, for, I I feel like anybody who's been watching this over the past years has been who has been watching this this uh, show will kind of get it. <clears throat> father, you're still muted. You're muted, Father. <laughs> and they are after. Me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Spoiler alert. Um, you know the thing about. I just want to help everyone out. You know we're like code words and double speak. Mm -hmm. You know what? Um, and I mean, full disclaimer, I have live freely tattooed on my knuckles, you know? So, um, just to throw this out there, I don't know, just throwing it out there, right? But freedom could be the kind of inversion covert for rebellion. Yep. And if you if you can kind of look and see behind what what's going on, you know, um, slavery, you know, is slavery slavery is a word that's used to undermine obedience. Um, and again, you know, coming from a libertarian background and on crack and all this stuff, they, like, you have to take the context in when I'm saying this, you know, but I think this is really important because it's the thing that really makes the difference in, in, in a lot of ways. I know it feels like everything makes the difference, but um, it's really hard for people. Let's just talk about orthodoxy and Christ and repentance. It's really hard for people to um, have a discerning intellect uh, and have a heart that's able to hear, hear, hear from the Holy Spirit, um, follow Christ if they're not willing to really go through the kind of gauntlet of obedience. Um, and and that's not like an abstract thing. You know, it's going to be your boss. It's going to be your husband, your wife. Um, and it's it's one of those things I'm just saying from my, in my own life, thinking about moments when I fail, and also thinking about moments when my eyes were open, and it was the hardest thing, but I still chose to obey. And you know what? Um, I'll say it: God rewards and blesses that type of obedience. Um, and this gets us into a whole thing. I'm sure people will want to talk about, like, what about you know? bad authority and all that, you know, well, we can talk about that, but I just, I think maybe I don't want to derail it completely, but I just want to throw that out there because the bait's too good. You know, when you see him talking and the charm and all that stuff and it's like, yeah, it's, it's too good, but there's something, there's something spiritually, I think that is really, um, you know, potentially very dangerous for people. Well, he, he obviously he obviously has freedom as an idol. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no because he because he said he's willing to die for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I, it, it makes me wonder, like, what is it? What is it to pray at the altar of freedom? Like, what even is that? I mean, what you is know what I mean? Freedom? Like, well, this is this is the thing. Like, what is freedom? Like, is it, is it to be able to do whatever you want? Well, do us not will. Do us not will. Do us not will. Which, which is uh, the the law? That's correct. That's yeah, Aleister Crowley. Law. That's the that's the that's the Luciferian <laughs> demonic law. You know, I just want to get out ahead of some of this though, just to sh save people some time in the comments, so we can get to some good stuff. But like, <laughs> um, you know, like Tsar Lazar, um, you know, the champion of the of the Serbian people in the Orthodox Church. It's like he died for 
you know, when you read um, St. Nikolai's account, the, um, the mystical meaning of the Battle of Kosovo, it's like the gold, golden freedom, right? Golden freedom. And, and it's something that he embodied, that the Serbian people embodies that, you know, orthodoxy embodies. But that freedom isn't the freedom of do us that wilt and liberty. It's always couched. I mean, this goes back to St. Paul in regards of, you know, if you want, if you're not comfortable with St. Paul, we can talk about Bob Dylan. You got to serve somebody. And that's, I think, one of the things you need to discern is that when when this is this is what's tough for people. It's like we want to be able to have conversation in the marketplace of ideas and have this kind of opens up a little bit what we were talking about, Supreme, with Jonathan and Ark. And what does it mean to want to be in the marketplace of ideas and try to really deal with people um, in the sense of acknowledging where they're at and then our distinctions and belief and practice and, and all that. And um, I think people would, you know, kind of maybe rightfully so, I don't know, look at what we're saying, like, okay, fundamentalists, whatever, not everybody's Orthodox, not everybody's, Christ, not everybody's Christian, blah, blah, blah. But you have to understand that I, I, for us, and that's the whole point is, you know, getting over that that place of playing the game of like, okay, I know Jesus is real, but just for the sake of, you know, getting on stage with you, just for the sake of like trying to have a, have a seat at the table, I'll put that aside and we'll talk like whatever. You know what I mean? And we all have to for, for, Forgive me, Father, but I don't, like, I don't, I, I, I don't, for, for me, that doesn't seem like, for me, that doesn't seem like that's possible. Like that wouldn't be possible for me. I well, don't this think. is what I'm trying to say. This is this is what I'm trying to say. This is why okay. this is really difficult. Is because when we act like that, that's the setup for these. That's the setup for these really problematic movements that that begin to happen. Right? Is that the compromises that are made for the sake of being civil, sophisticated, all those things? They're, they're just that, they're compromises. And those compromises, if if you take that term compromise out of the kind of like colloquialism of civility and discourse, and let's just talk about, do you want the whole of your shit to be compromised? Do you mm. want the breaking system of your wife's, you know, family mm -hmm. van to be compromised? Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Let's mm -hmm. let's let's take the the word compromise and put it in that context. Then it's mm -hmm. like, no, I don't really want that compromised. I want I want my wife's breaking system to have integrity. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mm -hmm. want the doctor operating on my mm -hmm. child to have integrity. I don't want to yes. be compromised for the sake of whatever, right? So I'm just saying this because one of the hardest things for us, and this gets back to um I'm kind of like, I guess, doing a, a little capitulation here but just going back to the to the mindset of being like a libertarian and being like you know the the big battles trying to get people to understand third party first you know what i mean you know that whole stage of like third party and just getting people out of the the, the binary of republican and democrat like no there can be a third party i you feel like that's the whole thing you spend so much time trying to get people to even open their mind to that. And the one of the big arguments is, I don't want to choose the lesser two evils. You know what I mean? That's one of the big arguments you use. It's like, no, why do I have to choose a bad option? I don't want to. So here's a third option. Are you following me? So like along that lines of thought, if you now apply that in its most proper context, which is spiritually, it's like, yeah, you know, when you see someone kind of being like, hmm, yeah, I don't know about all that praying thing, but I like this and this and that. Look, man, <laughs> when that cat's talking about freedom, he's not talking about freedom like you and I are talking about freedom, right? Because there's there's something else that comes with that. Because, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that really, like, that's not even really freedom, though, because I was talking about this with somebody today, and she was basically about to leave my work because she couldn't handle, because you're not allowed to smoke at my work. Mm. She couldn't handle not being at 
a place where she couldn't smoke. Mm-hmm. And she was like literally about to like, she was like, I'm leaving right now. And she's talking about all these bad things that were going to happen, but she still wanted to do it. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then I told her, I was like, I was talking to her and I was kind of trying, like, I didn't really want to try and talk her out of it. Cause I don't know if that's really my job at this place. Again, like, I don't really know. It's like, do what you're going to do. I mean, I can't stop you. But at the same time, you have to realize that what you're talking about is not like, you're essentially wanting to choose your freedom. And the thing is, is like your freedom is, um, it's, it's based on the, it's based on how, like, you are not free from your fear of negative things. That's not, well, she's not like, even free from her addiction. Uh, well, you know what I mean? She's a slave to her even, addiction, clearly. <laughs> I'm not even touching that at this second, except maybe I am. But like, I'm saying, like, no, it's like life is going to be like this. Like this feeling that you have right now, just like wanting to crawl out of your own skin because you're having to wait for something. So really that's all she had to do was wait. She had to wait for like a half hour for someone to come pick her up. She was wanting to walk like two miles down the road to a gas station just to get a pack of cigarettes, carrying all this luggage behind her and stuff. Mm. And it was like, so the freedom that like this guy's proposing, it's like, well, sure. Maybe on paper you're free, but like at the same time, like, are you are you free to like handle that negative, those negative aspects of life in a way that doesn't like bring you down or are you like, cause there's no freedom there. You're still ultimately think, like enslaved to what you think life should be. So but I, I think you're bringing up a good point. I just, I guess maybe we can even get ahead of that. So people don't lose their minds, but you know, making even that distinction, cause there's the broader argument of like government. Right. And even, um, cause I remember watching the full interview when it came out, you know, and it's just like, yeah, that's why I said it's like, you know, the bait's too good not to take because everything he's saying, it's like, yeah, you know, and it's great. He's standing up against, you know, the woke tyranny and all that stuff. And that's, that's all great, you know, but the thing is, is that for, for the sake of the argument, we'll make that distinction, right? There's the freedom that comes in in and only through Christ, right? Um, and it's being freed to from no longer being a slave to your sin. And so in that sense, we can be like, what's his name again? What's his name, Jorge? M- Millet. Millet? Yeah. Like, yeah. Millet, you know, right on. I don't want to be a slave either. I want to be a slave to sin, you know? And we can, we can, we can play that game, right? We can play that game. We can go like, yeah, I'm going to be a slave to sin. That's great. I love freedom. That's great, too. And it's great to have an example of what it might look like to have actual civil discourse with different ideologies. You know, like, it'd be great to be able to be like, well, I respect where you're at. Even though you're an atheist, you can respect where I'm at. And if you can do that, then maybe we can get along. And, you know, as Christians, we should be able to do that. We should be able to go like, hey, you're an atheist, but if you do you and you let me do me and we can find a place of of common respect, you know, um, I don't need to tell you. I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate. Um, Well, playing God's advocate. So (laughs) I (laughs) I don't need you. You know, I don't need to tell you that your basic moral principles, Malay, are Christian. I don't need to tell you that. If you're adhering to them, it seems like you are. Um, Because he talks about Christian values and stuff like that um, in regards of the broad Argentinian culture, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I saw the interview. He does. No, he does. He does. He talks about that. Catholic specifically. Yeah, Catholic. Very weird. Yeah. Very and so, weird. Yeah. It, well, I mean, he's, he's, he's what you, he, if you want to know what Mussolini would have looked like as an embryo, that's him. I mean, he, that's good point. Good that's call on that. Yeah. For sure. That guy right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know yeah. What I mean, um, and so, yeah, you know, tip, tip the hat to Catholicism, you know, it's all good. And like, and you can do that, but I think, that move right there will help everyone kind of flesh out what I'm trying to say. Cause I know there's some people who's like, man, man, if I can't contradict yourself, this guy's all about these conservative values, this and that. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But I'm just telling you, like he's the embryo of what, of what ends up becoming fascism. And 
and I don't mean fascism. Like I'm not, I'm not talking, you know, trans flag calling anybody who doesn't want to like agree with me as fascist. I mean, stereotype. I mean, like textbook, like like C Kyle, yeah, like, like well, yeah, like, and just I'm I'm gonna give a shout out, whatever. Forgive me, I'm gonna give the plug, but I'm I'm gonna do it. It is worth everyone's um, time if they're interested in this to read um, "Fascism in the Light of the Cross" um, by uh, by Brother Augustine and I, Michael Whitcoff. Excuse me, by Michael Whitcoff. I I would, if you really want to understand fascism, that book is worth your time to give you really good kind of insight to it. But are you snapping something, Father? Oh my gosh, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he's in the zone, but I'm going to let him know. Say anything. I was like, if that I'm means he snap, I'm going to let him snap. That's yeah. what I mean. it's been. A, it's been a whole day. Anyways, um, yeah, he's this Sorry, guy right. is the embryo of what will become fat. He's a he's an embryonic fascist. That's I, the, I think, I think, Father, um, this whole thing of people saying, Oh, but he's but conservative values, conservative. This is something that I noticed like maybe two years ago. And I started to thankfully, thankfully, most of the people that I know who had fallen into this, most of them, but not all have actually been since I noticed this and pointed it out, have since been catechized, baptized, chrismated. Right. And what I had said is that it seemed to me that there was this growing like it's the it was a post libertarian thing and that i was calling it christianism mm. so like it wasn't christianity mm -hmm. it was the ideology so it was like all of the the things of how a christian would act i guess mm -hmm. as a moral framework mm -hmm. so it was like they didn't want christ they wanted christianity mm -hmm. and i was call, taken to calling this christianism and mm -hmm. I feel like that this is like he's he's really manifesting sort of like what Christianism looks at at the top. And it's like it 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 seems to fall into this sort of situation where they can have a conversation about Christian values completely devoid of Christ and that they don't even have to believe that Christ is God. They don't even have to believe in God like that. You could be a Christianist atheist so to speak but i think you know people are like but look it's these christ it's these conservative values it's these conservative values and like what i would say to them is well yeah you're seeing candles you're seeing incense you're seeing chanting but it's like what is it pointed at because you use candles incense and chanting to summon demons too yeah to worship satan too yeah and and i would i would just kind of insert um you know, blessed Sarah from Rose right here, you know, that, that great quote, those, forgive me for butchering it, but essentially those who are kind of enamored with, with censors, investments and incense, they'll be the first ones to fall for antichrist. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, I guess this is, this is, you know, kind of like our thing, but in light of seeing, um, you know, government officials, movements um, that are, I mean, it, it's interesting to me too, because it makes me think about who else are we going to see kind of follow in, in the wake of this, you know, and what other kind of movements are we going to see on the wake of this? Because, you know, people have been sick and tired of, of woke, you know, and, it, and it's, it's at the point now where it's like, okay, now it's really time to make a, to make a change, um, which is you know, what we've been talking about. You know, what's, what is the, um, what's the season going to look like um, when these things kind of come rolling around, you know, but it, it's, it's definitely not going to be Christ because mm -hmm. people want conservative values. They want to be in peace, but <laughs> you know, it's, it, the, doesn't make them want Christ really anymore. I mean, that's, I think this is one of those things where, um, you know, order just for the sake of order. Right. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not Christ either, you know? 
Um, well, the, the, and one of the things that, and it's so interesting because I feel like, let's say 30 years ago and before, as I was coming up, if you talk to somebody about conservative values, I feel like it was always like pro something. Mm -hmm. So it was always like, like, like family, you know, church. It was always like toward, toward it. They'd be like, what are our values? Okay. This is what we believe in. Even if it was like, even 20 years ago, if it was like self-sufficiency, you know, these sorts of things, conservative values. Now, what people are calling conservative values are all anti. And it seems like as we move along on these pendulum swings, that like the idol that they're worshiping starts getting more and more hidden. So it's like woke, at least like they have diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like and it's funny that they always do DEI instead of what it really is, which is D-I-E, because it's a death cult. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, it, it's so weird that that has just slipped everybody, slipped away from everybody to see. But at least like, at least they have something that they're for, right? Hey, we're for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And it's like, okay, this guy, Millet, he's not actually for anything. They call him like right wing, but he's not. He's just anti left. And like you listen and he's just like anti communist, anti leftist, anti state. And it's like, that's fine. But what are you for? And he'll be like the free market. And it's like, well, but the free market is the absence of regulations, legislation, <laughs> borders. So it's like, no, you're just against those things. Like, what are you for? Because you're clear. You must be for something. He's for something. something. But what is it? Yeah, he's for something. I mean, guess what it means to be seen. He's he's for something. We'll see. That's the date that uh, to me that's the that's the that's sort of the scariest part and as I've as I've come to understand the little tiny tiny bit that I do of orthodoxy and as I've come closer to Christ, one of the things that I was even thinking today when it came down to this freedom thing is that like and it really hit me this week to where I, 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 but today particularly, I just, I really just stopped for a minute and just gave thanks to God that he has freed me from ideologies. Mm. Like talk about freedom. I, it was today that I really realized maybe like three, four hours ago that I was like, oh, wow, I'm like, I was such a slave to ideology. I was searching around like, oh, I have to have an ideology. What ideology do I adhere to? Because without an ideology, I'm lost. And now I'm like, oh, I'm freed from the isms. I've been freed. But see, the thing is, though, isn't it because ideology is the secularist's religion? Yeah. Th yeah. Well, each right. one is an idol, right? You each one I mean? is an idol. Yeah, for and, sure. And, and it's so funny because I think another way to kind of turn 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 over what you're saying is like um you know orthodoxy isn't about being you know against something it's you know it, it's it's not orthodoxy is not defined by by what we're opposed to it's it's, a, it's defined by who we're for it's the yes and you know the yes and and i think it's interesting too because you know one of the problems that we're gonna have is that we have um it's really hard for us maybe to look at what's going on in other countries and, and to see to have a measure of objectivity i think because our framework is so skewed you know like no one you know you've heard it's this whole thing about no one is you know there, there is no right everyone is just kind of like center left you know um so if you if you if you're in that kind of framework what I'm saying right there, it's like it's really hard for us to to really have any type of objective look at what's what's going on um politically anywhere because it's you know, our house is on fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, we're, and it's it's really tough to kind of like I think this is why this, I think this is why this I, I could be wrong. I think this is maybe why some of our project has been helpful and important. To because um, to be able to talk about politics just honestly as you know Christians, right? And and to be able to really be honest about all the pre presuppositions that we have, like we don't want to have them, but 
being able to be aware of them, I think is important because the that kind of naive, that naivete of just like, hey, again, the bait's too good. I like what that guy said. It's like, yeah, I like what he was saying too when it first came on, but you know, I'm I'm trying to really practice this kind of discernment of being like, okay, well, what what is what's really lurking behind this? Because we're not this is one of the problems about the the kind of globalist context that we're in now is none of these things are what happens in our Argentina affects us now in ways that it never has, right? All of these things, all the all that's super contagious now, right? All it takes is for you to catch a glimpse of something online and be like, you know, I mean, an idea, or I guess more importantly, a personality can spread like wildfire in a way that it never has before. So I guess what I'm saying is if, if looking back on history, um, if it, if it seemed like fascism um, and, you know, socialism spread like wildfire in, in world war two, you ain't seen nothing yet because now, you know, personality can, you know, turn on the black mirror and you, you can just get infected that quick. Well, it's, it's what, one of the things that, like the word that's coming to my mind when I'm, I'm hearing your description there is it's, it's sobriety, right? Like, mm-hmm. I feel like there's a clear lack of sobriety. And like, I look at this guy, I saw when he, when he won, they have the videos of when he, when he, you know, when it was announced that he won and he came out on stage and he's running back and forth on the stage and he's going like this and he's flexing and posing and he's pointing at the audience and ah, like, like he's at a rock concert. And I was like, yeah, you know, like Trump does that too. And like, if you look at like a Trump rally, it's the least sober thing you could possibly imagine. Like people are not there to be sober. It's like a monster truck. They're there to, it's a rally. It's a monster truck route. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what they're there to do. They're going to wear their little things and they're going to do all of this and whatnot. And it it was just like, for me, the idea that you could not be sober and you've just been tasked with the fate of tens or hundreds of millions of people and you're not sober seems to me like you don't even really understand what's happening. Like you don't even really either, either that or you're really out in it to hurt people. It's got to be one or the other because it, like, so for instance, not to say that he's like the perfect model, but at least he has a pedigree to understand. It's like, there's a vast difference between the attitude of let's say RFK Jr. Robert Kennedy mm-hmm. and Donald Trump in terms of like Robert Kennedy is a much more sober individual to where you could tell he sort of well and but again his father was killed for running for president right yeah. so he really does understand what's at stake that will sober you up quick like i i just i don't know i don't <laughs> i i don't know about moving away from that too quickly what do you mean well, the guys, I mean, his dad was assassinated. His uncle was assassinated. Like, let's, let's really kind of stop right there. And, and I think you're in, I think your comment there is profound, right? Um, you know, this is, this is one of those things in regards of sobriety. And, and even for us, right? I mean, so many people now, like, are so far removed. It's really sad because there's so many veterans from Afghanistan, Iraq. We don't even, we act like they don't exist. Yeah. Where are their voices? Where are their voices? I mean, so many veterans who are maimed. Let's not talk about, let's not talk about dead. Let's talk about maimed and crippled. Um, Both mentally. And and mentally. Yeah. I was about to say. Mentally and, and physically. Right. Um, no one thinks about that. No one talks about that. And I think that being absent from public discourse for us is one of the, is just that alone points to the lack of sobriety in our society. Just that alone, right? No, I can't ever think about, I'm sure someone would say, no, there's this, 
there's this representative in, um, you know, outside of Metropolis in Iowa. You know what I mean? And he talks about it all the time. Okay, great. But the reality is, is that most people and the way that most people digest public discourse now, they're not hearing that stuff. So even things that should sober us up, like you would think, I stand by this. I don't, I, I mean, man, we are so close to having some sort of terrible incident happen. Um, you know, nuclear war, dirty bombs, something like that. Like you would think there'd be more sobriety. And there's like, there's people who talk about this, right? But you would just think there'd be more sobriety in the discourse going on. I mean, even in today, I was seeing, um, you know, just to bring some sobriety, um, uh, in in uh, Ukraine, you know, one another monastery was taken over, and the priest got his jaw broken. He's in like critical con- con- condition. I mean, it's just it's crazy what's happening, and it's like we're watching. If we're watching, we're watching in real time real persecution happen in, in the church. Like, forget everybody else, forget Melia and everything. Let's just talk about right real persecution happen, and it's like. It, it's not a word of it, right? Why? Because it's, there's a there's a lack of sobriety, and it's really easy to get caught up in the desire for utopia, and or or the desire to shoot down someone else's utopia, which you know I can be guilty of for sure. Like full acknowledgement, okay, great, you got me. But I just think in this moment, for whatever it's worth, I just want to highlight that because I'm glad you brought that up because when someone understands what's at stake they'll be sober. They'll be, they'll be sober, you know? And it reminds me, there's this, I've been, I've been wanting to talk about this the last couple of weeks. I don't know why it's been in my mind, but um, there was this um, Justice League animated series. So good. It was uh, Bruce Tim, the same guy who did um, Batman, the animated series, you know, mm-hmm. that really great one. Um, that noir one, um, which little side note was it's interesting. I didn't know this, but one of the reasons why it had that great look is it was done on black. The cells were. Oh, really? Yeah. That's why it was so, so. Oh, so they had to bring stuff out of black yeah. in order for uh, it to, and, to get. So that, so all the negative space was black. Yeah. And like everything is, mm. so had, that's why everything has just that dark, that really that's- dark. It's what so a cool, cool touch. It's perfect. perfect. Yeah, it works. Cool touch. Anyways, um, so series after that, Justice League. Unlimited. Unlimited. Um, well, well, there is Justice League and then Justice League Unlimited. You're right? talking about the one. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant the, the second Justice League show. Yeah, I am. I, I'm actually, I am, Andrew. And this is good. You're clairvoyant. So, and the Unlimited one, uh, they added on um, the extra guys. The first one was just like the, the golden five. And then on this the unlimited, they actually uh, added extra guys. So there's this one episode where they got these guys, Hawk and Dove. And Oh yeah. Yeah. Hawk and Dove. They, yeah. 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 Hawk and Dove. And um, I almost, man, it'd be great. On, <laughs> one, one of the few moments I wish we had pre-production. Cause I wish I could cue this up to show everybody, but there's this one episode with Hawk and Dove and it's really great and it's really apropos for our conversation today. Because first of all, Hawk and Dove are these characters where obviously it's a play on the political disposition of being, you know, a hawk, like being for war and a dove being a peacenik, right? And they're these two brothers and they can like change into powers, whatever. And so they're like, they're on a mission with, um, it's like Wonder Woman, whatever. It also of. takes place in a Southern American country, I believe. I no. Think. It takes place in the Eastern European country. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like a faux Balkans country. Really? I remember yeah. that differently. Okay. Wow. That's actually really profound. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. And so anyway, so so basically the, the gist of this episode is that Hawk and Dove, you know, they're kind of called in to help Wonder Woman and someone else settle this territorial dispute it's almost as if it's like the justice league's kind of version of talking about 
you know, Croatia, Croatia and Serbia, you know, something like that. You know what I mean? So anyways, in the midst of this um, episode, um, there's this arms dealer, smooth looking guy, blonde hair, whatever. And he's selling arms back and forth to both these warring um, nations, right? And he eventually sells this one nation this thing called like it's like called eliminator or something like that and it's basically this um kind of like instead of being like a mech armor it's charged with you know um olympian power right one of the one of faustus one of the gods uh, made it but the reason i'm bringing this up is you know it's really great because there's these scenes where um it's aries who is the um arms dealer and he'll just kind of be in a business suit and he's talking with people, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there's this one scene where, you know, the one kind of the one faction wins a a battle basically. And he's like, okay, let's go finish them. He's like, no, it's good. You know, we just wanted our borders. No problem. We're good. And he's like, what? You're not good. And he's just starts like you filthy dog and this, and this and that. Right. (laughs) And he's, and the guy's just looking at him like, you know, I don't think I want your, I don't think I want your services anymore. And he's like, yeah, right. And then he goes full Aries and then just unleashes hell. Anyways, really great episode. I wish we could have queued it up. But the reason why I bring it up is because that episode to me is one of those things where I'm like, wow. You know, I, I watch with my kids and I'm like, see guys, this right here, this is how the world works. Mm. I, it's like somewhere down the line there is Aries there's this embodiment and you know I'm watching um Milieu's face whatever what's his, whatever his name is um and you know I'm just watching I'm watching his expressions and I know people get father up. forgive me that's so oh that was a really interesting that his name is so close to Milieu oh, which yeah. would put yeah. him as like worldly would yeah. be like he's of his age you know what I mean? He's of the world. Ooh, interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. Well, I mean, forgive me, but do, does everybody remember Fauci? Faust, Fausti, the Fauci and oh, bargain. Fauci everybody. Means, what does it mean? Fauci means Reaper. Whoa. In what language? Like Italian. Really? Look at, look at wow. Yeah, Fauci, oh. means Reaper. Fauci means Reaper. And so wow. like, this is. I mean, see, this is. This is the thing. It's like, look, I'm, <laughs> it's just if you for those who have eyes to see, let them see. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'm watching this guy and I'm watching, and I know people get whatever. It's like, you know, we're getting too much on Baloney and um, Maloney, Maroney, Maloney, Maloney. Yeah. And I'm just telling you what people have tells. Like, well, these things have tells. You know what I mean? And, you know, getting back to this episode, why I brought it up is when he said, the, like, there's these key things. I want to be an embodiment, right? Yeah, I want to give it a body. I want to like, give it a body. Yeah. Gotta, like, who talks like that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who talks like that, right? And, okay, sure, maybe someone can talk like that. But then you kind of keep adding it on. You keep adding it on. It's like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? So I'm just saying... You know, this is this is the thing because um, uh, I don't want to go too far with this, but you know the whole Joker thing um, from a couple years ago and the you know embodiment of chaos and just wanting to just bring forward chaos for the sake of chaos. You know, like these ideas are introduced for a reason, and we've talked about this before, like. It isn't, you know, Joel Silverstein, I got this great idea. Here's this great screenplay. It's like, I, we've, we've talked about this before. Like, you don't have ideas like you think you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, not if they're any good, you don't. Not, they're any not good. if they're any good. Or, or original, quote unquote. Right? Like, you don't have ideas like you think you do. And so, if you take that conversation, if you remember that from episode 23, and you scale that up out of just entertainment and you go into things like social engineering 
politics. You see what I'm saying? Um, and then that gets us back to principies and powers, you know, and really understanding this is, again, this is why um, if no one else, shouldn't we be the ones who talk like this? And I'm not mean us here on the show, but just as Orthodox Christians, right? Because we're the ones reading the prologue every day. We're the ones who we look to those who defied the emperors, right? Out of holy obedience, by the way. Mm-hmm. Like you can flip it be, it was disobedience, yeah, but it wasn't that's disobedience. Really... It was out of holy obedience that they defied emperors. If you understand that that paradox that I just threw there, you know? And how- yeah, Father, for, for, forgive me, forgive me. Like, I, can we just sit on that for a minute? Because I think- that you know you read the lives of the saints and it it would it just wouldn't make sense you know you see all these times where starting with pontius pilate really because i mean they're they're you know it's the it's it's the the holy spirit there and it's like from pontius pilate through all these governors and all of these martyrs you get this sense reading the lives of the saints that it's like these governors are so frustrated right they're like asking these saints they're like why won't you just mm. just like and i'm not mm. even they're like i'm not even asking you to deny christ i'm just saying just a pinch of incense what's the problem why won't you do this and they throw him in prison and they bring him back and they're like how about now is this not enough for you like what's your problem why won't you just do this and it seems like it would make no sense for one of them to be like because i just don't want to I just want to be the embodiment of freedom. It's like, no, no, no. The person, the person who would say that to start after one day of torture would be given the pinch of incense. Yeah. Which is why when this guy is like, I just want to have freedom. And then he's like, okay, so let's have freedom. Here's what I'm going to do. This is what he ran on. He's like, let's abolish our central bank. Let's adopt the US dollar as our currency. And then we'll be free. And it's like, wait a minute. You mean then you'll be under the Federal Reserve. You'll be a slave to... So I don't understand. What do you... You know what I mean? And it's just, I feel I feel that this is something that people miss and I missed it when I was... That's why I wanted to sit on it, right? Because like, I missed it. I moved to New Hampshire to be part of the Free State Project, right? It's not like I'm not talking from an experience of my own ignorance here. And it's just like... And that's that was one of the things that turned me off was all of these people who would say, I would die for freedom. But I'm like... Nah, you wouldn't like you wouldn't even suffer a little bit for freedom because you don't you it, it's nothing. It, it, there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure, um, you know, those like conversations where someone chimes in like me too. But like you've moved on from like a while ago. <laughs> I'm about to do Go that ahead, real quick. Do it, please. <laughs> but I just put it together that because the other kind of like leader that's talking like this is from italy right that prime minister lady maloney maloney Maloney. except she i I feel like she is a little more explicitly catholic well this is you know what i mean this is what i'm talking about it seems like catholicism a primarily catholic culture and even better if it's a catholic culture but not practicing that that's the seed to just throw these things in these like these like these embryos just like throw them in that seed so i'm sure this is something you guys realized and it was just need didn't need to be spoken probably like three years ago or whatever but i'm just gonna say it, it seems like that those are probably like the societies that 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 would thrive because so, forgive me andrew i just want to jump in real quick because you have a really great point i just want to build off of it it's really great i think your point is profound because I'm going to people who can, I just want to cut them off at the pass and just say this, you got to understand one of the big problems that we have is that um, Rome is, is built off of this. All you have to do is in all due respect, you know, I'm, I got, there's great people, love them, whatever. We're not talking about individuals, we're just talking about like the bigger thing, right? Um, Melkites and, uh, Ruthenians and just basically like Byzantine Catholics, right? It's just, yeah, 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 you can have your rights. You can have, you know, your externals of orthodoxy, just the pinch of incense to the Pope, just the pinch of incense to whatever. And it's like that ethos is how you get Rome where, <laughs> that's how you get the Rome of now. That's how you get the Roman Catholic Church of now, right? Because 
that same ethos that would say like, yeah, we don't, you can do whatever you want. Just bow your knee to the Pope, right? It's the same one that allows you to have Pachamama uh, on the altar. You know what I mean? And it's the same one that allows all this crazy stuff that's happened in the last six weeks coming out of Rome, right? That's how you have that. And that's super important because, you know, God bless Dr. Taylor Marshall and all those cats, but like, let's just be real honest, right? That disposition ethos happened a long time ago and you're just seeing the fruit of it, right? You're seeing the fruit of it. And they're trying, that's just to kind of make it concrete for everybody. That's why, you know, those of us who are opposed to it, those of us who have looked at whatever pejoratives you want to use, hyperdox, uh, liturgical rigorists, like whatever pejorative term someone wants to use now for traditional Orthodox Christians and clergy. This is why we're so resistant to these things, because once you begin to give way in the praxis and the externals, then the ethos is gone and then the spirit's gone. And then that's because it's not just about having the externals of the quote unquote Byzantine right. Because, or the Latin mass. Or the Latin mass. Or it's set like, of a contest and all yeah, of that it's stuff. Like yeah. All that stuff. It's just like they like that's that's one of the things that people a lot of people they'll go years until they get it. They'll go years of like doing set of a contest and then like mm-hmm. going Byzantine, you know, Catholic and doing stuff until you finally realize. And then and then at some point in time, God opens up an opportunity and you go like, I don't know how I've heard this so many times. I don't know how to explain it, but there's something living here and something's dead over there. That over there, just it's hollow and it feels empty mm-hmm. and it feels kind of like costume, but there's something because it is, it's a living tradition here. And that's objective, ethos, it's objective, fe- visceral feeling that they're having. It's, yeah, it, and because it's, it's a living experience. When the Orthodox Church is not, is not the experience of the externals of a liturgical rite. And it's one of the it's one of the reasons why the kind of academic quote unquote um, the exclusively academic theologian that you know kind of like will or you know I kind of have my radar on sometimes because that disposition that wants to treat things of the church like that is so problematic. It isn't just kind of like anti intellectualism, whatever. But blah, blah, I'll give you an example, like Father Boniface, right? Who was on here? Father Boniface is great. He's a great example of like he's a, he's an, he's an actual academic and a priest and he's not one of the academics that I'm always warning about. So it's, so I just want to be clear. It's not about being anti-academic, but it's like that living experience of the living church, the Holy spirit, right. In the life of the church, it's not about the externals. And we, and we see this and, and I just wanted to hop on that. Forgive me for cutting off Andrew, because I didn't want, I didn't want to get that point lost because your theology matters. What you believe is going to affect how your society how your society plays out. That's that's one of the reasons why, you know, I don't know. I, I know it's tough. We can have conversations about it, but it, it's one of the real big hurdles about "quote unquote" American orthodoxy. Because one of the things that people just cannot. I mean, I would love to have a conversation with someone about it. I'm sure someone will clicky clack. Like I would actually really love the conversation about it. Maybe we can have one at some point in time. Um. The pro-American, and I guess to kind of like, you know, poke a bear right now, like the pro-Southern, like orthodoxy being indigenous, like what indigenous orthodox looks like in, in the South, which, uh, you know, uh, hey, um, it's, you don't, you know, <laughs> you don't know me like you think you do. Uh, I would say my big problem is, is like, what I'm trying to get is what is it coming out of? Like, People just, you can't reconcile the fact that you can't agree with me what I'm saying about um, the Roman, the, the Latin Roman ethos and how that affects societies because what the, the, your theological perspective, the, your theology will affect how your society is, right? You can't agree with me on that. And if you're an Orthodox Christian, like, and if you're kind of like in the, in the camp, whatever, you would agree with that. But then not be able to really suss out the fact that you got some real problems in regards of quote unquote America and like certain places. And like, you just have to really kind of recognize that because those things 
So another thing I'm trying to say is one of the problems that people need to, re- we, you need to really work through it. And I don't think just gloss over it is like, you cannot get around the fact that this country forget slavery, forget all that stuff. It's based mm-hmm. on Protestantism. It's based yeah. on, it's based on enlightenment ideals. Like you can't yeah. get around that. Oh, forgive me. Forgive the. Are, are we no, talking about was... like, are we talking about like uh, Appalachian Orthodox yeah, 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 here? Yeah, yeah. Like, what are we talking about? Kind yeah, of? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, like, I'm just saying that that what Andrew was talking about, it seems like a, it's a, it seems like a little bit of a, a bunny trail, but I don't think it is as much as you think. Like, mm-hmm. Andrew's making that point about it seems like Catholic countries are really susceptible to this. And I yes. was thinking up, like, yes, because that's the Roman ethos. Give the pinch of salt to, to the Pope. Yeah. And you're good, right? And we see that mm-hmm. with the Byzantine Catholics. Like that's in there. And I submit to you, that's why that's one of the things we point to. Like, yeah, this is this is why we would say they're hollowed out, is because of this ethos, right? And that ethos mm-hmm. is going to carry on into the countries and societies that, that are shaped and formed by them, right? Your theology matters, right? Mm-hmm. And then you go further than that. And I'm just saying that's one of the issues. I'm trying to bring in a little bit more domestic now. I see what you're saying. That's one of the issues that we're going to have and that we do have. And, I, and I'm all for that, that discussion about like, yeah, okay, the South is a great example of where orthodoxy could have an indigenous, you know, could come up indigenous. And I'm, I'm not shutting that off completely. I'm just saying you need to reconcile some things first, you know, and you reconcile mm-hmm. it not by sweeping it under the rug and doing revisionism and being like, you know, did we have this conversation not too long ago? Am well, I- uh, well, I think, Father, it's related to the conversation that we had with Father Boniface because mm-hmm. it's we were talking about iconography yeah. in that way. I feel like this is related, and I feel like there's some there's some interesting nuance here, and I understand what you meant by like saying where is it coming from. I think I understand. Tell me if this is tell me tell me if I'm I'm on the track here. Is that it's something like. If if I need to make this chant sound like something that you're used to in order for you to come, yeah, then there's a problem because yeah. you're not coming for Christ. You're coming for the old, the thing that you're used to. Yeah. And yeah. like it's it's actually preventing you from drawing closer to Christ. Is that yeah. am I sort of on the track of this? Thing? Yeah, so. A couple of weeks ago, the nuns and I went to a um, symposium or like, I don't know, like um, whatever. And it was a nice, I want to be charitable, like the intention's good, whatever, you know, it was. Um, so there was there was an activist that was written, uh, uh, the activist for uh, racial reconciliation. And it was. Um, being performed by this um, uh, this ensemble here in Kansas City. It was kind of like a national de- debut or something, right? So the nuns and I went. And um, essentially the way it worked was you had one choir. There was like one kind of choir, but the choir is made of a couple different ensembles. Are you following me? So one portion of it was like obviously doing what I call high Western Americana um, choral arrangements, right? Um, and you can picture what I'm talking about, right? The sweeping movements, right? Americana, Western movements, right? Choral, right? Um, uh, Benedict Sheehan stuff, for those of you who know, you know? I can't, but that's okay. I'm I'm just here for the ride. Yeah, if... If I threw out something, if I sharp like right. a Benedictine monk style. No, 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 right? no, 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 no. Oh no. no. Okay. No, no. What is no. this? There's a there's a composer's name Benedict Sheehan. Oh, Benedict. He does okay. a lot of like American arrangements of Orthodox oh. stuff. Um, if you can think of like, um, gosh, this it's they're choral arrangements. If if they're like Western, they're like Americana folk. Hmm. Not folk as in like guitars, but like Americana ar- choral arrangements. You know, think of these, um, it's like high Western opera stuff, you know, okay. but it's not okay, 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 okay. It's, it's choral, it's choral arrangements, you know. You have okay, to- okay. 
So anyways, just look it up. Benedict Sheehan, you'll see. It's like, you'll get it. It's like, oh, this sounds like it would. Oh, it sounds Benedict like. Benedict Sheehan is the guy? Sheehan. Yeah, Sheehan. Sheehan. He's, okay. He's the composer. Okay, um, Benedict it sounds, Sheehan. Okay. You know what? It sounds like if you were to watch like um, like a a Western that wasn't trying to be gritty and and uh, like dark and contemporary, but just think of something, you know, not spaghetti Western, right? But think of something that would have been in like a tra- like a traditional, um, you know, John Wayne or like maybe like a Kevin Costner movie in the background, but kind of like very, you know, high. Course, I can picture that. I can baby. picture that. Okay, you know I, mean? I know what you're talking about. Yep. Right. So yep. it's it's one portion of that, and then there was a portion which was like you know standard black uh, gospel choir. And then some other kind of whatever contemporary stuff, you know. Uh, and they had, and the the guy who put it together, uh, one of the guys who put it together was he's an Orthodox guy, and he had like some samples and some beats, whatever. Okay. So what they were doing was they did this akathist um, as an arrangement, you know, and then just kind of presenting it. So they'd have these movements. So one movement would be this very American choral, high sweeping movements right um and then the next one would be just you know pretty much straight you know black gospel, metal right Sorry. well what was it? the thing that i found really interesting is kind of a long statement you know long roundabout way to get to this point but the that i were talking and uh, one of the sisters i think it was sisters again but one of the sisters had made the point where we were kind of like well i was there's all these things that were really problematic with it but one of the big things is that it's just looking to um, slap, you know, like take the words, like the thought is if we just take the words from something that's orthodox, let's say hymnography or an activist or something, right? And you just kind of slap whatever, you know, kind of music that you think people are familiar with or they're going to engage with, then that's it. Then that, then that, that's the secret to getting people um to engage uh, like oh how do we get people how do we get americans to be interested in orthodoxy and, and like this is the conversation uh, been for a long time how do you get you know quote unquote black people to like get into orthodoxy because the music's so foreign and blah 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 blah, blah right and everyone oh, that's the that's the wrong way in the context it's, of it's an totally activist that's way. like super dangerous it's right totally there. the wrong way it's totally the wrong way and like hey uh, you know if anyone wants to you know, if you want to come at me, I'd love to talk. We can discuss it. Let that have a thing. I've been on panels about this before, but I'm just saying, like, people, like, the that's the way that you do. First of all, people are pulling from the wrong influences. They're too, they're, yeah. they're, they're too forward. You have to go back. If you're talking about, quote, unquote, black influence, you have to go back, like Blind Willie Johnson, back. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing I'm really trying to get at is what you're trying to say. It's like, it's not about slapping something on be like oh here's let's just take some words because again that's a western approach the western mindset is like hey how do you know what a tree is cut it down count the rings with a sect whereas the eastern approach is like you live with the tree you know what i mean mm. so the, the thing that people don't understand is and this is why you know the, again man there's <laughs> there's lots for people to come at me this this week i've never been to a western right liturgy so full disclaimer right there. I've never been to one, so I'm not going to say too much about it. I know St. John and Maximovich, John Maximovich of Shanghai, his involvement with it. And so because of that, I, I see it in theory. I had a wonderful pilgrimage to England a couple weeks ago. Um, I went to uh, the relics of St. Alban wonderful you know what i mean and for me there was a whole thing there getting in roots with my you know my english roots great whatever but still i've never been to a western right liturgy and i feel that all the conversations i've had around it feel pretty much this everyone's experience is in line with what we're talking about here which it just it's it's produced so that you can say, well, here's some orth- the the West was Orthodox at one point in time, and just to almost prove the point, we're going to artificially, and in a sense, kind of make something that's contrived just to kind of prove the point. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's 
problematic because that isn't it, it's basically making a frankenstein yeah. right well you, we you, sorry there's a lot yeah i i didn't we we talked about this at one time i asked you father like in an alternate timeline or whatever if the west and the east hadn't had a schism would there have been a western orthodox church or would the style have continued to be eastern in the west and i mean um like i think that's an interesting thought because i mean i have been to a western right liturgy and my wife who was catholic says it's very reminiscent of that is is there something inherently problematic with adapting west but it, let's let's take it under the presumption that this particular parish that I'm talking about that I went to, who I am fond of, um, I don't go to them often, but when I do, I prefer it Western Rite. But when I go there, it's let's take let's put a presupposition that this is not in the account. Of, this is not to like draw people in or to prove a point. Right. It's where's it like, coming from yeah the mm -hmm. the motivation let's just give them the benefit of the doubt even though i don't know the full story of why they are western right they're rocor western right church it's like why are they western right i don't know but let's say for one second that it's not out of some kind of like weird cringy thing you're talking about like is that inherently problematic to have that like well here's the thing the western right started because as I understand it, I'm sure someone has it, but you know, St. John Maximovich was keen on reviving the Orthodox roots in the West, in particular, like France, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he's credited with developing the Western Rite in this sense, as I understand it. And again, I've never been to one, right? So I have to put that disclaimer out there. The reason why I brought it up is just to, to give an example of, I haven't had the conversation with someone even even people who are charitable, and I'm not being uncharitable, but I'm just saying my point I'm trying to get across is there is a reality to a living tradition versus a tradition that's resuscitated like a Frankenstein. And there's a there's a reason why the, the, <laughs> there's a reason why you see problems with certain things like for instance problems with these people like oh let's just take black gospel and maybe some orthodox words and slap it on and it's it doesn't work mm -hmm. it's it doesn't well, work because it's well, it's yeah it ceases to be prayer this is what's coming to me right in in the terms of an akathist like my so my my experience as limited as it is but like recently doing a whole bunch of Akathis every day or Akathis every day. You know what I mean? It, what I found was and like I actually would find myself in a state, like in the state that I know as the state of prayer, mm -hmm. right? Once I, had, once I had become accustomed to it, mm -hmm. like I found myself and I was like, oh, wait, this is really weird. And there were times when I would have to like, really like bring real myself in or whatever but i was like oh this is interesting that i'm like it really became prayer and i feel like if 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 my focus had been on like the form more and the word like taking a form and taking the words and a performance of it mm -hmm. i feel like it would that that necessarily precludes and prevents the ability to go deep into the Akathist itself. And what was so interesting about it was I would come out of those times. And this, this was the most, and I had wanted to like, I'm glad that we get a chance to talk about it. Like I would actually come out of those times, even though like I would understand the Akathist, the words in the Akathist better. Mm -hmm. Like each time I would actually come out the times when it was prayer, I would be like, whoa, it was like what was inside was being revealed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and I just feel like what's being the, what, what you're describing in terms of what the person was doing there with the best of intentions would actually prevent that objective reality from taking place. If that makes sense at all. I'm trying to explain something that's difficult to explain. Well, here's the thing. You may not you didn't, you may not have intended it this way, but it, it does prove kind of one of my points is that 
the activist is is actually somewhat of a, a, a you know for orthodox quote unquote a recent development in the church. They're not like super. I mean, they're old, right? But they're not like ancient, ancient, ancient. You know, but they're you know they're whatever. But the reason why I say that is because they're a part of our living tradition. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, there's a reason why they're yeah. there. Let, let, me yeah. just, let me let me let me find another way to say this. Like, it's not like you just can kind of like I want to pray and then slap something on and do whatever you want and not have the Holy Spirit guiding and leading. Like people just think if I just show up and pray and kind of do whatever I want, the Holy Spirit's involved. It's like, no, it's like, no, that that's not the case. And that's why we can look at an activist and go like, you know, activists are again relatively speaking, I don't know the exact date, but I know they're not, you know, they're a relatively recent development in the church, you know? Like how recent um, are we talking? 100 years, 200 years? More than that. But 500. Maybe you can look it up. I don't, I don't know exactly right now off the top of my head, but I know the recent development. And no one doubts that the Akathist is prayer. No one doubts that the Akathist is part of our tradition. Why? Because... What is the tradition? What is tradition? Tradition is the experience of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to get at is some of these other movements, when we when we look and see like there's a problem there, it isn't just like people aren't just getting, they're not getting behind it. They don't understand. You know, if they just would understand, this would take off. It's like, no, there's, there's something there in which the Holy Spirit, in which something isn't, something isn't quite jiving. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And so, you can sense that because this is where you'll get even like great ideas. How many times has, has something happened? And someone's like, man, it's a great idea, but why did it not take off? Right? Because it isn't just about what we want. It's there's a worship is sometimes it's, I know it's weird, but people for <laughs> sometimes people forget God in their worship. You know what I mean? It just, it becomes about, whatever thing they got going on, which kind of gets me back to my other points. Like the one, the, one observations when the sisters made about it, it's like this act of this, whatever the gospel requires, it was kind of like, you know, God wasn't consulted with this. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Wow. Like, that's yeah. a good way to put it. That's, that's a great a way to put it. 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 it was just about like, Hey, we got an agenda. We want to, we, you know, racism is wrong. And you want to make sure you know you know include uh, what is it die diversity exclusion you know, yeah yeah like e uh, equity yeah yeah like like that is like that's definitely kind of put forward more and I'm not trying to throw shade <laughs> I'm not trying to throw shade I appreciate people making efforts but you know if you want to ring me up I'll tell you this is why these things don't work you know what I mean and the things that will work are things that kind of people don't want to do you know what I mean because uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you right here right. Well, what does work? I'll tell you what works, man. Repentance. And the thing that people are, so for instance, right, I'm just, we can try to loop it back to the big thing, but I think it'll connect, right? God willing. Like in this conversation about like music and like, how do you make music that would attract black folk, whatever, blah, blah. Well, first of all, one of the problems is that the, the broader culture, when you talk about quote unquote black people, is not sober to kind of bring it full back around. It's not. Yeah. Their palate culture. is corrupted. Their palate is already corrupted. corrupted. Yeah. So black culture in, in the kind of broader, you know, sweeping statement, right. Isn't sober. Right. Um, and so until something happens, right. Looping back RFK until something happens to really sober people up and someone go, and you would think, Right. Here's the thing. You would think that everything that a lot of black neighborhoods and communities go through would sober them up. And for some people, it is. This is why I just want to throw this out here. This is why you're seeing and there's more of it, I think, than people realize. But it just doesn't get the coverage. There's a lot of people with the, the what is it? The, they call it a um, walkout or whatever. Um, like they're like the walkout movement, the walk on movement. Um Basically, people who are leaving the Democratic Party. Blacks who are leaving. Oh, the a blackout. No, 
it's it's something. it's a leaving. It's like Candace Owens, right? She was kind of yeah, one of yeah, the first yeah. people that to do it. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was her book. That was Yeah, yeah. But it's something. It's it's something. Whatever. Okay, like. okay. But but it's, yeah, black people leaving the Demo- Democrat. Yeah, party. because yeah. we're like okay, because this is the kind of thing. It's like man, you know how how what will it take for to wake up, right? So if you're following me, I'm trying to connect with like RFK, right? Why is he sober? Because his dad was assassinated. He realizes that this is no joke, man. People will die, right? And so what I'm trying to say is, like, you would think that, you know, uh, not all, again, but large portions of Black communities and people who are into, quote, unquote, like, popular Black culture, which is not sober and corrupted, would wake up because it's, like, the death rates, the the, the homelessness, like, all that stuff, right? It's all there, right? Okay. But you need to you need to get to a place of being able to really recognize and appreciate sobriety when it's being presented to you is what I'm trying to get at. So the music needs to be sober. And this is why, you know, when like the black gospel choir, like everyone's happy and clapping their hands, like, ah, that's great. That's not going to do anything. (laughs) It ain't the blues. It ain't the blues. It ain't the blues. And it's not going to do anything because there's nothing to be happy and, and be clapping about. Uh, now's the time for you to be wearing sackcloth and ash. And that's why you got to bust out blind Willie Johnson. And that's why you got to bust out the spirituals and be like, man, woe is me. Right. Because that's the thing here. And here's what the Orthodox got. Right. That's the thing that actually engenders grace. Right. A broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. See, that's the secret sauce for the Orthodox. Right. And so be careful, all you Orthodox people who want to have, you know, whatever. Because I've had people like, oh, you know, I just, it doesn't, it's not happy or whatever. It's like, yeah, well, do you want God's grace or not? Because there's a place, um, yeah, there's a time and place for everything. But what, if you want to enter into those places of worship in this life, it happens through repentance and mourning. Sorry. I, I'm Sorry. <laughs> Father, you know what's so what's so interesting about this, and what's weird is you've said this before on this program, and it has not registered to me that actually, Black America, yes, had grace yes. until rock and roll. Yes, it was rock and roll that removed yes. where God took His protect. Yes. Black America was being protected and moved along with the Spirit until rock and roll. It's incredible. And now, you know, you talk about, oh, what what would it be? You would think that the death would sober it up. You would think that like the homelessness would sober it up. And it's like, except for the fact that the music has been glorifying it. (laughs) That it's been saying, oh, no, no, that's the price for for stacking chips. You know what I mean? Like, that's the the price. (laughs) I mean, because we'll just use it because, I mean, this is like it's it's all about like what's your role. Right. So this is this is the role of. Uh, of the African American, I, I believe, you know, is to be like this kind of like Christ like figure in the sense of like, what, like, where, where, where are we best in repentance? <laughs> you know what I mean? And what is rock and roll? Rock and roll was taking the music of, of the music that was consecrated to God and then wanting it to be like, nah, 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 we want to celebrate like the whatever, you know what I mean? The passions. That's, that's what happened. And then from there, root and like, look, I'm, I got plenty of authority to, to say this. You know what I mean? I dedicated most of my life to rock and roll. So I'm telling you, like, that's, you can't get around it. That's what it's, that's what it's about. And the fruit of it, you see it slow. And there's, um, there's a documentary that's interesting. If you want to talk, it's uh, Uncle Tom 2. Um, real interesting, better than the first one. It talks about basically like the kind of lie that everyone has bought into about like victim narr- the, the victim narrative. And it's really about the lie and the kind of uprooting of traditional black culture um, from, you know, they, they trace it from the civil rights movement on, but I'd say it's before then, actually. I mean, but up until, you know, Re- reconstruction like up until then it's like you know how is it that you had african americans doing better then than they are now right how is it that there was dignity and more wealth then than now right how is it that they african americans did better in jim crow and all these things am i saying we should get back to jim crow no and all, see that's the problem retarded people 
Um, excuse me. I can't say that word. Uh, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can okay. because you're using it in a technical way. Yeah. Like you're people, saying that their understanding has yeah. been retarded. Yeah. yeah. They think like, no, no, no. But it's like, that's obviously it's not going back to that. What I'm trying to get at is when a people group tries to get out from under their suffering, there's going to be a problem. Look, let's switch from here. Let's jump off of here because people are probably tired of hearing it. Now let's talk about the Serbians. Let's talk about the Greeks. Let's talk about the Russians. Let's, and let's talk about everybody who does great. They do great under suffering. Christians do great under suffering. Do I want to suffer? No. Do I want to see my children suffer? No. But that doesn't change the fact that that's, that's what we're built for. That doesn't change the fact that all the great things that we pine for as Orthodox Christians happened in suffering, happened from suffering. Like that's because the servant isn't above the master. So when you get into getting back to these, these this issue with cultures um, and the lack of sobriety and, you know, Andrew's great point. Sorry about this really five hour long rabbit trail about what Andrew said. I just think it's, it's pertinent to say that that aspect of the pinch of incense to the Pope, like that's part of the problem. And that, that tendency is why, you know, Roman Catholicism is essentially syncretic. You know, it can, it can and does take on anything as long as you got the right allegiances, you know? I think, isn't that what's so like, like um, cringy about Protestantism is when they're like, Hey, you know, who is a real rebel was Jesus, you know, like when they're like, they're really like, they're really stretching the, like the, like the really like basic tenets of Christianity to really make it fit this like, young skateboarders worldview like isn't that where like that joke comes from of like you know who's like the real Fortnite is jesus and it's like okay like you sacrifice the dignity of the church in order to like find a way to find this commonality between you and this person when really like i never needed that or i didn't think i did I, like i didn't like at the end of the day there were yeah various agendas blah 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 i they're certainly fell into my fair share of pits but like at the end of the day it's like no that i didn't want i didn't want that at the end of the day i wanted the church to stay exactly the same i wanted to be grafted onto it like i didn't want to bring my own thing into i mean i did but at a certain point i realized i was like wait no i don't it's just like when a a child is testing a parent and then later on you realize that maybe like 16, 17 is like, I'm really glad my dad never backed down about that. I'm really, really glad that like, he never like, you know, held like decided to just like, well, you know, this one time we're gonna let it slide in the, you know, in the interest of kind of like keeping things light and, you know, airy and stuff. It's like, no, I'm really glad that as much as I like tried to kind of like, well, you know, the fathers were in a different time, you know, things are different now in America, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm really glad that the whole time and, you know, in heaven, they're like, nope, nope, nope. This stuff is not, it's not for like taking your interpretation and like, you know, making freedom. The- it's not for you to have freedom to go full circle. Yeah. I mean, and like, at the end of the day, like what father is saying, I think that's what I was trying to say at the beginning. It's like, I think that is real freedom is like the ability to like bear your cross. Like that's the real freedom is because it's just like, if what I was trying to tell this lady, and I'm not sure that I got it across is like, if this is like, if like, if this is the worst that life can throw at you, then you're free. Cause it's like, I can handle that. There's this whole like part of life that I think a lot of people are afraid to go to because it's difficult it's really really difficult and you know when you get to a place of being really honest with yourself about the way you feel you can kind of see in other people where they're really afraid to go to these parts of themselves i mean i'm certainly guilty of it too but like that's not freedom then because you're constantly playing this game of like runaway you're like constantly trying to like and then like that's its own enslavement so you're like you know, I'm free, but you're like, you're constantly running and moving. It's just like, that's, that's a really, well, you're, you're, you're a slave to your own victimhood, right? That like, there's always, there's always somebody or something that is against you. 
And if that thing is removed, you'll find so, like, you'll find the fact that it's like, well, everything is fine, except I don't have a pack of cigarettes right now. Mm -hmm. So let me make that the biggest, dr most dramatic thing possible. And then it's like, oh, I've got the cigarettes, but oh, now I'm hot and sweaty. So yeah. now I'm being victimized by the world that I'm hot and sweaty. And it's just like that. And people, people are people can't even realize they can't even see the degree to which they're enslaved to their victimhood. And it's and they're so unhappy. Yeah, they're so unhappy. And it's weird because like we will talk about the wokes are like the prime examples of this. Mm -hmm. But the anti wokes. Right. This is their degeneracy is your trap. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the anti wokes and the, the Marvel's movie is the prime example. Right. To where it's like, look, you can't even go and enjoy the movie for what it is, even knowing that, OK, they're purposely there's purposely some woke stuff going on here. But you because of the woke stuff, you're like, oh, the movie's terrible. Just yeah. off the jump, just off. You have to discard every single thing because you're victimized by them being woke. You can't and enjoy anything in life. That's like that. And like, I just like, I've talked to many a dude, you know, cause whatever comic book movies, whatever. But it's like, if you can't like sit back and as bad as it is, and I would certainly say it's bad, but if you can't sit back and enjoy she Hulk, like, I don't know what's going on with you, man. Yeah. I it's mean, it's like, it's a stupid, sh it's a TV show. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a comic book show, man. It, Come on, dude. About, remember, remember we talked about this when Black Panther 2 came out. Remember this? Right. And I was like, nah, actually, because um, what's your boy's name? Um, uh, Tim Pool did this whole thing about like how terrible it was and how woke it was. I was like, this guy's never read the comic. Yeah. Because everyone was like, oh, so woke. I was like, what are you talking about? Like they did that in the arc before woke happened. Like your Shiri is yeah. Black Panther fairly frequently. Like, I think all that happened that. long before woke, and it was just like I remember just being like, "Man, my, my Black Panther two was great." <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Because it's like it, it was. I I enjoyed it. Now you know the water scene was weird, and we talked about this before, whatever. But like, point being is, like that's. Like that's a whole other side of it, and I and I think I think this is maybe something that, um, you know, we're always trying to bring forward in our discussions, which is just not being pushed to the other side of things. Like I don't want to not be able to enjoy something, you know. We want to talk about freedom just because it's like, oh, you know, like even the um, perception of it being like woke well, when it may not be, you know, it's, you know what I'm saying. And even if it is, it's like. I, well, they're, I, they're 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 looking for a woke wherever they could find one, and it's like, look, if you if you're looking hard enough for wokeness, you're going to see it where it's not even meant to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, I mean, I I feel like there was an example of that not too long ago. I can't remember what it was. It was something, and I don't really watch that much media anymore. But it was something big, and like okay, like that Lord of the Rings show. Like everyone was up in arms, and yeah, I. I've heard it's pretty insufferable at some points, but I've known diehard Tolkien fans. There's a large contingent at our parish of diehard Tolkien fans. And they're like, it's fine. It's, you know, it's, it's fine. It's a disaster, but it's fine. Like it's whatever. It's cool. Like it's, in, it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. If you, and this is my last. And that's the key right there. We've lost sight of. Well, that it's it, meant to be entertainment. You know what I think it might be, and I'm sure both you guys are gonna be like, "Well, yeah, it's it's an overabundance. Yeah. Nobody can, nobody can properly because, like, there. I won't care what movie it is if I haven't watched a movie in two months. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, unless it's awful, I'm gonna enjoy it because it's a movie, <laughs> like." <laughs> because it's fine it's like it's i don't have to think too hard about it and like i think like nobody can be made happy and nobody can really like okay i don't want to say that because there are movies that have come out that have been generally everybody's accepted like that's a really good movie mm -hmm. but like <clears throat> i think the problem is is in my own personal life i have taken in such an abundance of media or content rather that at a certain point it's not doing that same spark of like light and simplicity anymore mm -hmm. it's now i've moved into like a darker realm of like i need to like 
chop down the tree to count its rings. You know, like I needed to kill the thing in order to like fully understand it and fully flesh it out. So I understand, so I can bring my A game to the conversation, I guess, to like to the to the online discourse or something. Well, that's the social media has done that because now we're all participating in a way that we were not participating before, which is an inversion of the church. Yeah. Hmm. It's a, the, 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 that's a social media is giving people a, a, an inverted church that is, you know, for the, the prince of this world as opposed yeah. to Christ because it's I, participatory. I'll, uh, I'll always plug this guy because he's, he's materialist, whatever. There's a comedian on YouTube, Ryan Long. Oh yeah, I love Ryan. Oh, Long. He's great. He's so funny. He's he like, nails it every single time. Nails it. Did you nails see it, his video it. where he's talking with people about the um, Israel Palestine conflict? No, I haven't seen and it yet. He goes up to these Hasidic Jews, and he's like, "So Israel, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. So, yeah, it's a little more complicated for us Gentiles. Like, he's just like hilarious. And there's this one where he does the Church of Woke. He does. Oh yeah, that one's video, great. And he talks about the confessional. They like live tweet your confession or something, and then they come out and everyone boos you or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like everyone cancels. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's so, so anyway, if you can check out his Church of Woke skit, he's absolutely, Ryan Long, he's absolutely hilarious. He actually came to Kansas City not too long ago, and I was kind of disappointed. I, there wasn't a chance, and you know, it was a snowball's chance I was going to get to see him anyway. But the point is, if I had gone by myself or with my wife to go see the Marvels, in a theater with no kids, we got to eat popcorn in peace and just sit there and just drink my water. I would have had a great time. I'm like, that was a good movie because like, whatever, it was enjoyable, stupid movie for two hours. And that's Mm -hmm. all it's meant to be. It doesn't need to be more than that. So, I mean, dude, it doesn't take itself very seriously. Like the end, if you, if if somebody's watching this and they're really going to, do a, a serious critique on you know the marvels as a state it's like bro like i'm not going to do the spoiler alert but the end is so ridiculous of how they get the people off the space station right it's so ridiculous and it's sam jackson doing it and so you're like if if you watch the movie and you see that part the ending part and then you're like let me do a serious review of the <laughs> marvels it's like bro you missed it you're, you're making a fool you're point. making a fool of yourself because this is clearly it's not trying to take itself seriously. It's like there's got to be some kind of term for it. The literary critic who's critiquing something or the music critic or, or the critic who is critiquing the movie or whatever. Well, well critiquing well, well, the critic. This real quick. Remember, this was that whole thing about um, and I saw this really clearly, like. Oh, getting back to the books. Remember when people were just kind of like losing their mind at first? And then there was this whole insight of just the people not having had anything to really suffer for, to die for, to be serious about. And, um, you know, COVID and then eventually Mm -hmm. like all the BLM stuff, it became the thing of like, yes, this is where I can be, Mm -hmm. you know, have meaning and serious and like sacrifice. See, that's the thing is people want people want to have something that they are willing to die for. People want something to be serious about something people have. It's, it's in human beings to want to be devoted. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what, that's the problem. The problem isn't that people want to be devoted. The problem is that these things, they're anti-Christ. Yeah. Right? Like, right. like, you know, I mean, we saw this, unfortunately, we saw this with, with, with people we love where it's just like, Yo, you are more into wearing a mask and making sure that, like, you're going to let all of us know that you're mad that we're sitting on the porch when we should be social distancing. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish you would have been so uh, zealous for Christ. Like, we saw people get, get zealous for wearing masks and social distancing way more than they were ever for the saints and for the church, yes. like Orthodox Christians, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And like that, that's, I think that's getting at the thing. And so that the, the literary critic and all these people who are taking like all this stuff seriously, it's like, you know, that desire is only fulfilled in the church, but they don't see the thing is if they can't have both, right? Because somewhere along mm-hmm. the lines, Christ, Christ said to them, hey man, you got to follow me. 
and not do this. And they go, I don't want to do that. And, yeah. and that's why every atheist argument is the emotional argument. Somewhere down the line, they didn't want to bow the knee to Christ. It's not about they, they don't believe whatever. You know what I mean? Because they're not going to believe anything because they have this thing in their closet that they that they want to do, and Christ told them no. So right. they're like, right. Christ. You know what I mean? Right. Saying? And so that's, that's, that's what's always at the heart. You know, there's never facts or there's never, you know, at the core of it, there's always these issues, right? And so I think that's the thing is people – want to be devoted they want because life is again who else in the world is saying this life is serious and this life matters right it's orthodox right repentance Mm -hmm. right it's not maya it's not maya you're not getting reincarnated you know what i mean Mm -hmm. we're saying no this 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 life matters and it's serious but there's also beauty and there's also joy to be had and there's also love right we hold all things together because everything is held in Christ's hand. But you, you can only hold all things together in and through Christ. He's the only mm-hmm. one that pulls everything together. So when people are trying to do all this other stuff, it's like, nah, I want people to take me serious and I want to be a crusader and this and that, but I want to do it for like the sake of safety or like whatever. That's not going to work. Yeah. You know I mean? But I'm without like, Christ, the, without Christ, any suffering involved is meaningless. So yeah. you have to wind up with some sort of a utopian ideal yeah. because you can't, you can't without Christ, you can't appreciate suffering. And this is, and I just, I guess, I don't know, this is where we're at at the end, but um, my talk at Montanica this last year was about um, basically utopia and watching out for it. Right. The reason I'm, I'm saying this is because, you know, this, this idea of utopia this is the trap. Um, and we can be ignorant and just think, well, it doesn't matter because, you know, I live in Des Moines and, you know, it doesn't really matter. But the thing is, it isn't just about utopia on the broad scale of your country or your state. The way you're running your household is, you know, if it's not in line with what Christ is telling you, you're trying to build your own utopia if you're following me on that. You know, and Christ does have an opinion. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I I guess I would sum up a lot of what we talked about today, you know, in that sense of like, whether it was like these ensembles with the activist or countries trying to do a thing and like, or even trying to like, excuse me, trying to define what the principles by which human beings should govern themselves. God's got to say on that. Um, And that's one of the core problems with a kind of exclusively, secular libertarian worldview is that it fundamentally says the only opinion that matters is mine. And that's why the highest virtue and value is, is personal liberty, but it's not because God's got something to say about how we live and people make mistakes when they act like God doesn't got to say, God does got to say about, you know what I mean? Um, And I don't mean just to say as in like a vote. I mean, like, (laughs) A say as in like he has an actual idea like of what should be and what shouldn't be. I I would officially like to throw it out there that that would be the name of this episode. Would be Christ has an opinion. But like I would just like to throw that out there because I think that's a good one. Like, yeah. hey, by the way, he's a, he's a guy. He, you know, he is the guy. Capital T, capital G. So like maybe we should be listening to him. But you know, who am I? Who am I? So, um. So, yeah, but I think it's great. Let's call it there. It's been about two hours. Yep. Um, So, so, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, If uh, you want to reach out to us, please uh, contact at royalpath.network is the email. I think I had saw somebody in the comments last week say, is there an address to reach out, an email address to reach out to you guys? That's it. Contact at royalpath.network. Lots of people are still hitting me up at Andrew at royalpath.network, which is fine. But again, I'm not very good at getting back to you guys. Um, Everything's cool with my kids, by the way. Just, you know, last week I had to step off. Um, Yeah, my daughter, uh, little Zenia, was sick. and But seems like she's on the up and up. So, Um, And then um, anytime we mention, I don't know if I'm going to put sweeping western choral music on, uh, <laughs> on the playlist but every time we 
mention of artist, generally speaking, I try and put it on a playlist. I'm not putting Taylor Swift on there. Somebody said that, yeah, you guys talk about Taylor Swift, so you should put her on there. I'm not going to yeah. do that. No. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's that Royal Path podcast playlist, something on Spotify, something like that. It's not too hard to find. Ryan Willie Johnson will be on there. Um, Ryan Willie Johnson, okay. yeah, that's a good Ryan one. Ryan Willie Johnson will be on there. I can, get, I can absolutely get behind that. Um, and then, uh, thank you, Jack. You are killing it again. All of these, it's just these, it's great. You're in a groove. I'm loving it. You're absolutely, you're, you're right in the swing of things. Thank you so much. He's the guy who does our thumbnails. We also have a merch store, royalpath.store. Um, and we don't see any of those proceeds. And then next week, I think we'll have an official announcement that it looks like we will have a, uh, a blend of coffee that named okay. after Royal Path from a Ro- uh, from the Royal a... Path blend. Yeah, so probably not too light, not too dark, or maybe <laughs> not not you know I don't know maybe a little bit of both you know, or it'll be light on the outside and then darker as you go in or something Ooh, like that. That's interesting. But, yeah, but um, and then but yeah, there'll be like an official announcement about that I think next week or something like that. And I think that I think that's it. I think that's that's it. it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you for having a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.